Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Life has turned out well, thought the sculptor turned deputy Marcus Wilson, standing by the window with a cup of coffee. His sculptures had gained recognition at the highest levels. He even presented one as a gift to the President's Administration Fund. By commission, he also cast a bronze cannon, now adorning a large city park. His works sold like hotcakes. By order, he forged fences and barbecue grills, painted pictures, and sculpted statues. Marcus was a jack-of-all-trades. Next to his large house, he himself crafted a carved gazebo and laid mosaic pathways throughout the entire plot. Copies of works by great masters stood in the yard, and he particularly loved Rodin and Michelangelo. His second wife, Larissa, became a singer and led a bohemian life. She could make $10,000 in a day, constantly disappearing at gatherings and parties. With his first wife, Monica, things didn't go well. She often drank, and despite his pleas to stop and break the harmful habit, she didn't react. Though sometimes he succeeded. Sometimes she found the strength to hold out for a week, no more. Monica was not capable of more. Marcus, in the end, couldn't hold back. Monica, I'm tired of your daily drinking binges. Don't you see you're heading into an abyss? I'm ashamed to invite friends over because you can't control yourself and end up causing scenes. Oh, please. Like you never drink alcohol, Monica retorted, disdainfully pushing out her lower lip. I do drink, but I keep myself in check and only drink at parties. And they're not that frequent. Marcus began to get more and more irritated. Do you know why I drink? Monica put her hands on her hips and lifted her head triumphantly. Why? Because you never pay attention to me. You're all caught up in your work. Either sculpting, building, or forging, and then those endless trips of yours. I've forgotten what it's like to sit with my husband on the couch and watch a movie. I need attention. Monica turned away from Marcus, displaying universal offense. I work to provide us with a carefree life and you bring discord to the family. Find a hobby, take care of yourself, do something other than wasting time watching TV shows. I don't watch them that often. And mostly out of boredom. What else is there to do in such a big house once everything's cleaned and arranged? Just lie on the couch and watch shows. Well, I read books too. Interesting. What was the last book you read? Marcus raised an eyebrow in surprise. Angelique and the King, Monica replied dryly. Good reading, I won't deny it. Though engaging. Maybe we should have children so your life doesn't go down the drain. Children? You're joking. My figure will be ruined, and you won't like me anymore. How could I not like the mother of my children? Let's try. Let's. Maybe life will really become more interesting and fulfilling. Deciding not to delay having children, the couple didn't put off the decision, and just two months later, Monica held the coveted test with two stripes in her hands. Marcus, I'm pregnant. She jumped for joy. What are you saying? Pregnant? I'm thrilled. Now you must take everything you eat and drink seriously, move a lot, breathe fresh air, and give up alcohol. Of course. You offend me. I've already made an appointment with the doctor. He'll tell me what to do now. And then I'll take parenting classes because I have no idea what to do with a little child. Monica was very pleased with herself. Perfect. Life's purpose has been found. Marcus smiled and went to his workshop. He had received a large order for a cast iron fence for the country house of a local wealthy individual. The payment for the order was very good. However, as time went on, things became tight, so he needed to work every day and put in a lot of effort. Marcus loved forging metal. In it, he found a special nature, both flexible and strong simultaneously. This hardness and flexibility fascinated him and supported him in difficult moments. After returning from the doctor, Monica went to search the house for a room that she would prepare for the nursery. After inspecting it critically, she called a designer. Hello. 
This is Monica Wilson. I would like to order a design for a nursery. Hello. When would it be convenient for you to meet with our design consultant? Even today works for me. I'll be home all day. Then expect a visit from 2 to 5 o'clock. When the designer arrived, a fragile young woman, Monica showed her the room and gave her instructions. Everything should be done in light and white tones. You can incorporate a children's theme. Draw the furniture that should be there, and I'll choose later. All right, I'll come back in two days to show you all the sketches for approval. I'll be waiting. Monica closed the door behind the girl and picked up her tablet. She browsed websites of online stores for children's clothing, flipped through catalog pages, and marked things she liked because she would soon be meeting her child. The pregnancy progressed fairly smoothly. Monica hardly gained any weight, walked a lot, and completely avoided alcohol. Although she really wanted a glass of champagne at Christmas. But Marcus didn't even open the bottle. He didn't drink it himself and didn't offer her any. Instead, they drank tangerine and mango freshly squeezed juices. They were very tasty but not exactly fitting for a New Year's drink. As the due date approached, Monica became increasingly nervous. She felt like she hadn't bought everything she needed, although the cabinets in the nursery were filled with clothes, toys, rattles, blankets, and quilts. But she felt like she was missing something. She ordered and bought the trendiest cradle, the most beautiful stroller. A mobile was expected for the cradle. It's a kind of carousel for toys that spins over the baby to music. Marcus didn't interfere, he only asked his wife not to buy unnecessary things. Monica, the child grows quickly. Where will you put all these things later? I'll take them to a donation center or give them to someone. Baby girl Alice was born in early March. High snowdrifts lay on the streets. The room was brightly lit from the abundance of white. Monica lay in a private room in the maternity hospital with a refrigerator and a television. Alice lay nearby, small and very touching. In the first days, she slept almost all the time, occasionally opening her blue eyes to look at the world around her. Monica adamantly refused to breastfeed Alice. No matter how much doctors and nurses persuaded her, she stood firm. The child needs maternal milk. No formula can match its composition. No, I won't do it. I'll express milk, but I won't breastfeed. And she did indeed express milk and fed her daughter. Doctors and nurses waved off the stubborn mother. But they felt very sorry for little Alice. Monica almost never held her daughter. She fed her when Alice lay in the transparent box. When the girl cried, she just rocked the transparent box back and forth. During sleep, Monica watched series and funny videos on her tablet and drank coffee. Marcus brought Monica and Alice home ceremoniously. He decorated the car with balloons, invited a photographer, and gave Monica a large bouquet of white roses. Let's go home. I'm tired of being here to madness. It's so boring and unpleasant here. Besides, the staff here is rude. You never like anyone. Have you ever tried working with people yourself? When you do, you'll change your attitude. Contrary to expectations, the birth of the child further distanced them from each other. Monica became irritable. Alice interfered with her sleep, her life. Alice needed care. Marcus, let's hire a nanny. I'm very tired. I'm so tired. Maybe it's postpartum depression affecting me like this. I read that it happens to young mothers. Don't exaggerate. Just lie down when Alice sleeps, and you'll feel better right away. I don't want to waste a second of my life. You know, I'm interested in many things. I feel like I'm missing out on life for an eternity while I sleep. Monica, you're not missing out. You'll catch up later. Right now, our daughter needs you very much. And she needs you to be lively and healthy. Think about it. Marcus, let's hire a nanny. Let her at least take Alice out for walks, and I can rest and do something during that time. We'll hire a nanny, right? Yes. Marcus sighed heavily and agreed. 
The next day, a casting for nannies began at Marcus and Monica's home. Women of different ages and social backgrounds came. Monica talked personally with each one and reviewed their documents with recommendations. Two days later, Monica chose a tall elderly woman with a degree in philology and excellent recommendations. My name is Deborah Thompson, the woman introduced herself. I've been working with young children for 20 years. I take care of them and give gentle massages. I provide basic medical assistance and teach proper speech. Mrs. Thompson, my name is Monica. Come over tomorrow after breakfast. You'll take Alice out for walks and care for her. You'll leave after the evening walk. Monica completely entrusted Alice to Mrs. Thompson and saw her daughter only early in the morning and late at night. Alice took her first steps under Mrs. Thompson's care. Monica didn't even want to watch. She was preparing for the Christmas ball at the sports palace and wanted to shine with her beauty there. She went shopping for evening dresses, shoes, and jewelry. After shopping, she went for a massage to a cosmetologist. She would only come home in the best-case scenario after lunch. But usually, this happened late at night. An article about Marcus was published in the local newspaper, Michelangelo of Our Time. Marcus was friends with the editor of this newspaper, and when he approached Marcus with a proposal to write an article, Marcus agreed. The article was illustrated with photographs of his works and awards received at various competitions. The newspaper had a circulation of 10,000 copies and was sold throughout the city. Marcus' fame spread far beyond the city. Customers started coming from the region and other countries. Marcus raised prices so that he wouldn't work from morning till night and could spend time with his daughter. The number of customers didn't decrease, but the production deadlines increased. After completing each order, Marcus always bought something for Alice. He didn't like useless gifts and tried to make sure each gift served a purpose. He gave Alice interactive toys, toys with different textures that made sounds, and logical toys. When Alice started teething, various toys for this purpose appeared in the house, colorful and with cooling features. Alice grew not by days, but by hours, and was an exact mini-copy of Marcus. He looked at her like in a twisted mirror. It's like me, but not quite, the young dad marveled. He poured his soul into his daughter and was very angry with his wife when she showed no interest in their daughter. Monica, you completely forgot about our daughter. She's always with Mrs. Thompson. Alice sees her grandmother either drunk or very early in the morning when you're still at home and haven't left yet. Tell me, is your social life more important than our daughter? Marcus, you're so boring. I need to distract myself when I'm constantly stuck at home and starting to sink into deep depression. Take care of the child, and the depression will go away like magic. Oh, please don't yell at me. The child is fed, dry, clean, so what's bothering you now? Arguments turned into scandals, and Marcus stopped speaking to Monica altogether. He spent all his days in the workshop and came to Alice when Monica wasn't home. When Alice turned one and a half years old, Monica became pregnant again. This time, the pregnancy was difficult. There was constant morning sickness, and she felt nauseous. To prevent premature labor, Monica was admitted to the hospital. She was given various medications. Monica spent almost the entire pregnancy in the hospital. She lay in a private room, alone, and didn't want to communicate with anyone. Her friends from the fitness club visited her, but soon they stopped visiting the pregnant woman. Monica constantly complained about everything and exhausted the hospital staff with excessive demands. What kind of food are you bringing me? And why is it without salt? It's impossible to eat like this. And what kind of beds do you have? Don't you have normal, non-squeaky beds? I can't sleep with this squeaking. The staff tried to avoid her. And if they happened to encounter her, they immediately made excuses, we'll fix everything, report to the head nurse or the department head. Then they disappeared from the room in an unknown direction. But then a new nurse came to the hospital. Her name was Gina Lewis. She was a tall, middle-aged woman with an icy gaze and a loud voice. She could persuade even the dead if it was necessary for her job. The entire medical staff was afraid of her. 
Starting her shift, she immediately encountered Monica, who came out of her room and aimlessly wandered the corridors. How good that I ran into you, Monica said to Mrs. Lewis. Not everyone feels good. I'm in a hurry. What do you want? Mrs. Lewis spoke familiarly with everyone. I'm bored here all day. I need to move. Bored, you say? Come with me, help me with an important task. Everyone's busy, and we urgently need to tidy up. What task? Where are you taking me? But Mrs. Lewis firmly took Monica's hand and marched forward down the corridor to a destination known only to her. Monica decided not to argue and treated it as an adventure. Mrs. Lewis arrived at the nursing station, pointed at a couch to Monica, and placed a box with a huge wad of cotton on her lap. Look, you'll tear pieces of this size and roll them into balls. Got it? Will you manage? And this activity will cure your boredom. Mrs. Lewis showed Monica the size of the cotton balls she needed. Then she sat down to fill out a journal. After that, she got up, approached the medication cabinet, opened the doors, checked the inventory against the list, and made notes. And what are these for? Have I made enough of them? You'll find out in the evening. Keep rolling. There's not enough yet. Mrs. Lewis winked significantly at Monica. In the evening, the corridor echoed with everyone for injections. Pregnant women approached, bustling like a flock of ducks, heading to the treatment room. Monica also left her room, she was prescribed injections twice a day. She observed the women in the treatment room. They were of different ages and appearances. It seemed they came from different social backgrounds. Some wore expensive suits or robes, brand name slippers. They had manicures and pedicures. Others wore worn out t shirts and pants or faded robes, with no manicures and unkempt hair. Monica considered herself part of the first category. She wore a pink velvet suit, had French manicured nails, branded slippers on her feet, and her pedicure was adorned with subtle polish. Monica took care of herself, unlike these drab mice. But suddenly, one of the drab mice rose from the bench and headed towards her. Monica recoiled. It was a tall, freckled redhead with hair tied back in a ponytail and cold gray eyes. Monica, is that you? I didn't recognize you, you look good. Got married, I guess, just like you wanted, to a rich guy. The redhead approached closely. Ramirez, Christina, is that you? This was Monica's classmate and friend. They had been close for a long time until life scattered them in different directions. Christina got married and moved to another city with her husband. After some time, she divorced and returned with her little daughter, Genevieve. Meanwhile, Monica was busy searching and hunting for wealthy men. Where are you now, Monica? Got married, I see. Yes, got married. He's as rich as I wanted. We have a daughter, Alice. Now I'm on my second child. Life has indeed become much more fulfilling. I got divorced. My husband kicked me out onto the street, just like that. He even raised his hand against me. First on me, then on Genevieve. I couldn't stand it anymore. Scratched his dirty face. He threw our things on the street and kicked us out. Thank God we got rid of that scumbag. I'm grateful to him for Genevieve, but otherwise, he can go to hell. How awful. Did you report him to the police? Of course. You know what they told me? Come back when he kills you. Bastards in police uniforms. And where are you living now? At my mom's place. Where else can we go? Genevieve is still little, not ready for daycare. Once I do that, I'll go back to work. Maybe they'll give me a room in a dormitory. They definitely will. You know what, have the baby and come live with me with Genevieve. I need a nanny. You'll also watch over Genevieve. You'll have your own room and I won't mistreat you. I'll think about it. It's a tempting offer, for sure. No need to think. It's settled. When the kids grow up, then you can look for a job with accommodation. Thank you, Monica. 
You've always been the best friend. Pregnant women entered and exited the treatment room. Soon, no one was left under the door except Christina and Monica. They entered together. Mrs. Lewis loomed over the table with syringes and ampoules. The cotton balls were there too. Expose your lower curves, ladies. Quickly now. I need to clean up everything. Mrs. Lewis had a resolute and formidable look. Arguing with her was not considered safe for life. Therefore, Christina and Monica did what this serious woman asked. Five minutes later, they left the room, holding cotton balls in the injection sites and walking slowly. Christina, whose child is the second one from? From my ex-husband. When he kicked me out, I didn't even know I was pregnant. And my mother keeps nagging us endlessly about eating. Says we're eating her out of house and home. Well, have the baby and come to me. We won't be bored together. I'll talk to Marcus. He's kind and should agree. The ultrasound showed that Monica would have a boy. The diagnostic ultrasound doctor moved the sensor around her round belly for a long time. Everything looks good, the boy is healthy. You'll need a follow-up ultrasound in a month. Okay, I'll do that. Monica lay there, watching the monitor where her little son moved his arms and legs. Here's your exchange card. The doctor handed Monica an exchange card and left the room. Monica gathered her things and walked back to her ward. The final weeks of pregnancy were passing by. She called Marcus. Marcus, we're having a boy. Are you happy? Of course, darling. Sorry, a client just arrived. Can't talk long. How about I come to the hospital this evening? Marcus, I'm tired of lying here. It's boring. Can't you wait a bit? Monica grumbled discontentedly. She didn't like being cut off mid-sentence. She went back to her room, turned on the TV channel playing soap operas. Her favorite show about a maid was on. Monica took an apple from the nightstand, sat cross-legged on the bed, and started munching the apple while watching the show. Meanwhile, Marcus was showing the client elements of the future fence. The client was very pleased. No one around here will have such a fence. Only me. Please don't make this for anyone else. All right, as you wish. Here's an advance payment for you. The man placed a stack of money on the table in the gazebo. That's too much. No, no. It's just right. Blacksmithing is a very expensive pleasure. I know. And it requires exceptional skill. I'm satisfied with your work. The man shook Marcus's hand. Marcus responded with a handshake. After the client left, Marcus prepared to visit Monica at the maternity hospital. Before visiting her, he wanted to buy her fruits that she loved, apples and pears, and a box of white pink marshmallows. Monica had a sweet tooth but didn't want to gain weight. An hour later, he was near the maternity hospital. Visitors were not allowed into the wards, but there was a special room where relatives could visit their women. Marcus called Monica. Darling, I'm downstairs. Come down. Marcus, wait, I'll finish the show, about 15 minutes left. Don't get bored there. All right. I'll wait. Marcus sat on a bench and started browsing pictures of wrought iron fences on his phone. He was looking for inspiration. He reviewed more than 50 photos, gradually forming an image in his mind of the kind of fence he wanted to create. Monica came downstairs, approached Marcus, and peeked into the bags, surprised to find everything she liked. Marcus, what should we name our boy? Monica leaned closer to Marcus. What would you like? I like the names Martin or Oscar. How about you? Those are good names. I think we can even consider double names now. Really? I'll think about it. Did you miss me? Yes, of course. I try to spend all my days working. I've got lots of orders now. I'll earn some money and won't feel lonely. You're amazing, Marcus. I'd like a smartwatch to track my pulse and steps. We'll buy one, don't worry. 
Marcus beamed with joy. No wonder. He was going to have a son. He loved his daughter very much, but he wanted a boy to pass on his craft. It would be tough for a girl with that. Okay, Marcus. I'll go. I really feel like sleeping. Go ahead. Marcus kissed Monica on the cheek and hugged her. She took the bags and slowly walked towards the elevator. The next day, Monica started having contractions. The interval between them was getting shorter and shorter. Monica moaned and screamed in pain. Unfortunately, Mrs. Lewis was on duty. Why are you yelling like a victim? It's not like you're the first one giving birth. The babies do. Just relax and breathe calmly. Your body will do its job. I can't bear it. Why does it hurt so much? Can't you give me some painkillers? Are you out of your mind, girl? Painkillers? The midwife will examine you now, and then you'll go into labor. In the subsequent hours, Monica's memories were vague. It was a continuous ordeal of pain. She was utterly exhausted but immensely grateful when her son finally decided to leave her womb, announcing his arrival in the delivery room with a powerful cry. Wow, what a big boy. Haven't heard a voice like that in ages. Mama gave birth to a big boy, look. Monica barely opened her eyes to look at her child before succumbing again to the pain. She was being stitched up without pain relief. She woke up in the patient ward. Nothing seemed to hurt. Her abdomen was empty, and there was no baby inside. Where's my baby? Monica started to worry sharply. Oh, don't worry, he's fine. Lying there, basking under the lamp. That's how it's done. Just rest. I'll bring him to you soon. The nurse smiled and adjusted Monica's blanket. I want to see my son, Monica said weakly, already drifting off to sleep. The sleep was brief and restless. Soon she felt pain again and woke up. It was dark all around. Night had fallen. Monica got up, put on her slippers, and left the room. She knew where the babies were located, she had seen them during her walks. Monica approached the room where the babies lay under the lamps. Under one of the lamps, she saw her son. He slept sweetly in a single diaper inside a closed transparent box. Tears ran down Monica's cheeks. I never cried like this for my daughter. She was born, and nothing happened. And now I cry. Monica stood by the window for a few more minutes and then slowly returned to her room. She didn't feel like sleeping at all. Monica decided she would name her son Victor. Yes, that name suits him better than Martin or Oscar. Although Oscar is a royal name. I should consult with Marcus. She lay on the bed, imagining holding her son in her arms. He was so small and touching. Strange, why wasn't she as thrilled about Alice? She couldn't understand that. Suddenly, she felt a strong desire for champagne. But where could she get it in the hospital? I should call Marcus. Let him bring it. She picked up the phone and immediately dialed her husband's number. Marcus, I've given birth. Yes. I really want champagne. Can you bring it to me? Monica, it's 2 a.m. Champagne? Just come home and have it. Don't do this in the maternity ward. You don't love me. I understand. Please, let's not start this. I just went to bed recently, and I have to get up early to deliver an order to another city. Forget it, go to sleep. Monica hung up. I'll have champagne anyway. In the morning, she called Christine. She had given birth to a boy two weeks earlier and was already at home. Christine, I gave birth yesterday. Congratulations, Monica. Listen, I really want champagne. Can you bring it to the maternity ward? I'll give you the money. I can. What kind? I'll send you a photo. Okay, wait. When it came to drinks, Christine was quick on her feet for delivery. She left the children with her mother, quickly got dressed, went out of the house, 
bought champagne from the store, caught a taxi, and arrived at Monica's maternity ward. They opened the bottle in the corridor and discreetly poured some into plastic cups. What a high! I haven't had any alcohol in so long. You have no idea, everything inside has dried up. Monica took a few sips and closed her eyes. I can't imagine. My mom follows me around and checks the cupboards. But I know places where I can hide things well. Christine grinned mischievously. You're a good one, Christine. You're always there for friends, never forgetting friendship. Monica hugged her friend by the shoulders. Why do you look so sad? Oh, it's nothing. It's just that my stepfather is inappropriate. He makes advances towards me. I try to explain with words, but he doesn't understand. I had to hit him where it counts. That got the message across, the creep. You never told me. Nobody wants to talk about that. You really need to get out of there as soon as possible. Once I'm discharged from the maternity ward, you should move in with me. Didn't we agree on that? Yes, we did. Thank you. You're saving me. I've been racking my brain about where to go with two kids. Don't worry. Everything will be fine, I'm sure of it. We'll find you a worthy man. He'll love you and your kids. I seriously doubt that. Who needs my baggage? If they need you, they'll need your kids too. Got it? She poured the last of the champagne into the cups. People coming and going paid them no attention. But when Monica returned to her room, Mrs. Lewis was waiting for her, soothing her crying son. Where have you been all this time? You look odd. Have you been drinking? It sounded more like a statement than a question. I didn't. Sweetie, I can see from your eyes that you've been drinking alcohol. What are you doing? The baby is crying loudly, asking for milk, and here you are around the corner drinking. Where did you find alcohol? Mrs. Lewis's voice thundered, seemingly throughout the maternity ward. I just. You foolish girl, that's what I'll tell you. That's exactly what it is. You're clueless. You do realize alcohol passes through the milk, don't you? Now express it, and you won't be able to feed until at least two hours later. Meanwhile, I'll give him some formula. Okay. Express the milk, I'm telling you. Do you know how to do that? Well, I think so. Thinking again. You're a careless woman. And she expertly explained how it should be done. Monica listened attentively. I understand. I'll do it. But don't feed him now, you'll harm the baby. Yes, I get that now. Monica was overwhelmed with guilt for her own weakness. She looked at her baby and was filled with affection. All she wanted was to hold him and feed him herself. Decision made. No formula. I'll feed him myself. With these thoughts, Monica expressed the colostrum that had passed, then droplets of new milk started to appear. Everything's fine. My mom breastfed me until I was two, and my sister until she was one. Monica lay back on the pillow and instantly fell asleep. The alcohol had taken over. She slept until evening, until she was awakened by a tap on her shoulder. A nurse stood over her. Monica, you should have fed your baby by now. He's hungry. He's lying there poor thing, crying. I heard him crying, came in, and saw you sleeping. I'll feed him now. Monica got up and staggered, feeling dizzy. She reached the transparent box where her baby lay and rolled it next to her bed. The baby looked at her with surprise. Well, what are you looking at? Are you ready to eat? And Monica, with an ancient maternal gesture, drew the baby towards her and arranged him so that he could comfortably nurse. Her son puckered his lips, and soon there were smacking and gurgling sounds. Monica was beside herself with happiness. Marcus and Larissa met after he had already separated from Monica. Marcus was exhibiting his work with a friend, and Larissa was walking around the city with her friend and casually entered an art gallery. They strolled among the exhibits and took photos of each other. 
During a posing session near a sculpture of two horses, Larissa accidentally bumped into Marcus, who was strolling through the gallery. Oh, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I didn't mean to. No worries, everything's fine. Did you like this sculpture? Yes, very much. It has something wild and unrestrained about it. Who's the artist? I am. You? Yes. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm sculptor Marcus Wilson. With these words, Marcus bowed to the ladies. Wow. Nice to meet you. I'm Larissa. She extended a graceful hand to Marcus. Instead of shaking hands, he kissed her extended hand. Larissa looked embarrassed, turned to her friend, who quickly typed something on her phone. Nina, let's go. We still have a workout today. Turning back to Marcus, she said. It was very nice to meet you. Marcus reached into his jacket pocket, pulled out a business card with his phone number on it, and handed it to Larissa. She took the card, opened her small purse, and placed it inside. Then she thought for a moment, took out her phone, and entered the sculptor's number into her address book. Meanwhile, Marcus continued walking ahead. The friends left the gallery, caught a taxi, and within half an hour, they were near their homes. They lived next door to each other. Quick, grab your gym clothes. We'll meet here, and I'll be off, Larissa said. Larissa climbed the steps to her apartment building. Unfortunately, the elevator wasn't working. Her apartment was on the ninth floor. But Larissa wasn't one to give up quickly. She sprinted up to the fourth floor in no time. Catching her breath, she continued her ascent. She managed to climb two more floors. On the sixth floor, there was a plant on the windowsill. It was an unusual cactus. It had grown significantly, but the owner hadn't thrown it away, they had just moved it to the corridor. A few buds were visible in places. Wow. It's still blooming. Who would have thought? Larissa sprinted up to her floor, opened the foyer, approached her apartment door, when suddenly the phone rang. It was Nina calling. Larissa, go alone. I broke my leg. Nina, how did that happen? I was running home and slipped near the entrance, falling on my left leg. I heard a snap and nearly passed out from the pain. Then I called an ambulance. Now we're heading to the orthopedic department. The doctor examined it and said it's almost certainly broken. What a terrible day you're having. What do I do now? We were supposed to go to the gym together. Well, now you'll go alone. I won't be recovering anytime soon. I'll take care of you. I'll be your personal rehabilitation doctor. You know me. I do, so I promise to listen. Yeah, you've disappointed me, friend. I'm terribly upset myself. My leg hurts terribly and is swollen. We had a hard time removing my shoe. Hang in there. Let me know your room number after you're checked in. Of course. Go to your workout and find some cute guy to exercise with on my behalf, please. Don't worry, I'll definitely work out. And then we'll eat cake for two. That's not fair of you, friend. I'm here hobbling and bruised, and she decided to eat my cake. That won't do. I'm about to jump out of the ambulance and crawl home. I was joking. Don't you understand humor? I do, which is why I decided against jumping out of the ambulance. I know you won't eat any cake without me. How did you guess? I need the right company for cake, and the right company is you. I'll be waiting for you. Nothing else to do. Or I'll come to the hospital with cake. Now that's better. Hang in there, friend. Okay, we've arrived at the hospital. I'll call you later. Larissa carefully placed her phone back in her backpack to avoid slipping and headed towards the fitness center. There, she entered the hall literally at the last minute and spent the entire workout thinking about Nina, imagining what she must be going through in the hospital. After returning home from the workout, she took a shower and started laundry. She and Nina had rented the apartment together and now being alone felt lonely. Larissa didn't like sitting idle. 
she decided to organize her purse. She emptied its contents onto the couch and began sorting through the items. First, she put the coins in her wallet, threw away all the unnecessary receipts, discarded gum wrappers, and found her favorite lipstick. Then Larissa reached into a pocket and was surprised to find Marcus's business card there. She turned it over in her hands and tucked it into the wallet pocket. Should I write to him myself? Or is it better to call him? Since the evening promised to be dull with no anticipated entertainment, and honestly, Larissa wasn't particularly eager for any, she decided to call Marcus after all. But she lacked the courage to dial his number, and she couldn't understand why. She simply dialed the phone number and anxiously waited for a response. His voice came through the receiver. Hello, Marcus, hi. It's Larissa. I accidentally bumped into you at the exhibition, and you gave me your business card afterwards. Remember? Larissa asked, inwardly shrinking, expecting a curt response. Of course, I remember. There's never been such an admirer of my art. Did you manage to see the entire exhibition? No, we didn't. We were supposed to go to the gym with Nina, but unfortunately, she broke her leg today and was taken to the hospital. Seriously? How did that happen? She slipped on her way home and fell on her leg. That's how she broke it. Unpleasant, to say the least. Yes, I was very upset. But she's still my friend, and we live together. We're renting an apartment. Is that so? And what do you do, Larissa? I'm an interior designer. In my free time, I enjoy singing. I even released an album. Interesting. You're such a multifaceted person. Where can I listen to your songs? I can send you a link via messenger. I'm not sure which one you use, though. I have WhatsApp. Send it there. I'll send you my recordings right away. I'll be looking forward to it. Sorry, Larissa, I have a meeting with a client. I need to prepare. It was nice talking to you. I'll write after I've listened. I'll be waiting. Goodbye. Larissa ended the call and couldn't understand what was happening to her. She was all fired up and felt a passionate desire. Could it be that I'm falling for him, or is it just the result of a long absence of relationships? I need to pull myself together, this isn't right. I need to be chosen, not the one doing the choosing. At that moment, Marcus felt the same way. From Larissa's velvet voice, a sweet thrill ran through his body, along with an unbearable desire. I've only seen her once. It can't be that I'm feeling this. I have a wife. But he couldn't stop thinking about Larissa and wanting her. Two months later, there was supposed to be an exhibition of forged items in the city's central square. Marcus was presenting his work there, and when he knew the dates, he couldn't hold back and message Larissa, come to the forged items exhibition. It will take place at Central Square in Pavilion 26 on February 26 and 27, operating hours are from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Marcus sent the message and eagerly awaited a response like a kid. Soon, a reply came from Larissa, I'll definitely come. Marcus rejoiced inwardly. He would see her again and feel her presence. It took Larissa a lot of effort not to message Marcus herself. She was waiting for the first move from him. The doctors examined Monica and Victor and scheduled their discharge for the next day. Monica immediately called Marcus. Marcus, they're discharging us. Will you pick us up? Of course, darling. How could I leave you? What time should I come? The doctor said that the discharge papers will be ready after 2 p.m., and we can leave then. Please bring Victor's discharge bag. Victor? Have you already thought of a name for our son? I. I dreamed of the name Victor. You don't mind, I hope? No, I don't mind. It's a beautiful name. Where is this bag located? It's in the closet near the living room, it's transparent. Oh, yes, I've seen it. Okay. Anything else to bring? For the nurse who will bring out the baby, a small gift as usual. Have you remembered about the photographer? 
Let's have some photos with us. I'll call them right now and arrange it. Then tomorrow, you call me and let me know what time we should come. How are you feeling? My stitches are a bit sore, but otherwise, everything's good. Victor is eating well. Are you feeding him formula? Are you teasing me? I'm nursing him. That's strange. You didn't want to nurse Alice. I was silly back then. Maybe it would have brought us closer. I don't understand what was on my mind. Well, I'm glad it's like this now. I'm genuinely happy for both of you. I'm happy too. I should go, I need to feed Victor. Monica settled into the role of a nursing mother. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Marcus headed home to the client's place. He wanted to assess the scope of work and negotiate the price. Extra money wouldn't hurt. Besides, Monica had already told him that Christina would be living with them for a while with her two children, acting as a nanny for Victor and Alice. This meant they would need to pay her salary. Marcus didn't yet know the exact amount, but having a certain sum was absolutely necessary. Upon arriving at the client's location, he made the necessary calculations, took notes, and agreed on deadlines. The deadlines were good, there was no need to rush, and the client was ready to pay half of the amount immediately. That's great because I'm going to buy materials. The money will come in handy. He immediately went to get the materials. Miss Thompson looked after Alice during his absence. Alice ate on time, took walks, and went to bed. Miss Thompson enforced strict discipline, but the girl missed her mother and was sometimes fussy. Miss Thompson understood this and tried to entertain her in every possible way. She read her fairy tales with pictures, and they drew pictures together to show her mother later. Alice, mom will come back from the hospital soon and bring you a little brother. Alice looked at her with a puzzled expression. You'll have a playmate. He'll be helpless at first, but when he grows up, you can play together. Marcus returned in the evening and went straight to the workshop, where he needed to make space for a new fence. He drove the car into the yard and unloaded the rods. When he finished unloading, Marcus closed the trunk of the car and put it under the canopy. The car was an indispensable helper for him. It was sturdy and durable. He had driven hundreds of kilometers with it while traveling around the country and abroad. He and Monica had traveled to seas and oceans in this car, and it never let them down. The next morning, he prepared everything as Monica had requested. He contacted the photographer, who agreed to go to the maternity hospital. Miss Thompson, I'm going to get Monica soon. You'll stay with Alice as usual. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything properly. Miss Thompson couldn't even imagine that she might not be able to handle something. Alice was very curious, and she couldn't be left alone for a second. All items within her reach were checked for strength and tested with her teeth. Therefore, all surfaces in the house were clear, and all small items, vases, figurines, and phones, were put away on higher shelves. But Alice devised a plan to reach them. She took a stool, placed it under the shelves, and stood on it. There was a horse figurine on the shelf that Alice really wanted to reach. Meanwhile, Miss Thompson carried dirty laundry downstairs, where the washing and drying machines were located. Alice reached for the horses and stood on the edge of the stool. At that moment, the stool began to tilt, and Alice had no choice but to grab onto the shelf. The shelf couldn't withstand the pressure and collapsed with all its contents along with Alice. Miss Thompson heard a crash and quickly ran upstairs. When she entered the living room, she saw the room in disarray and the child lying motionless on the floor. The woman screamed in fear and began to free Alice from the shelf and the shards of figurines. She checked the girl's body. There were only bruises and scratches. Thank God, Alice didn't break anything. Miss Thompson had the phone number of an acquaintance who was a carpenter. She called him and asked him to come and fix the shelf. I'll cover all expenses, just try to come quickly. The homeowners will be back soon. Okay, I'm on my way. Send me the address. The carpenter arrived and reattached the shelf. He didn't charge much and sympathized with Miss Thompson. 
you'll also have to reimburse the cost of the figurines that broke. I can imagine how much they cost. The child wasn't hurt? No, just a few scratches. I'll have to explain to the parents. What can you do, it was my oversight. And I was so proud that I had everything under control. You can't see everything, especially when you're an old lady. You're not an old lady at all. Don't say that. Thank you for that. Here, take the money for the shelf. Thank you so much for your help. Please. The carpenter gathered his tools and left the house. Miss Thompson cleaned up all the shards and wiped the floor. Three figurines were broken, and all of them were unique. The woman was distraught. Alice sat on the couch and played with her dolls. She seemed very engrossed in her game, but now Miss Thompson was afraid to leave her unattended, fearing she might explore something else. And her fears were not unfounded because Alice was inspecting the room, looking for something else interesting to investigate. She noticed the wall clock with a pendulum, but they hung very high and were out of her reach for now. Alice spotted interesting things in the glass cabinet in the showcase. Marcus's awards were displayed there, along with various shells and stones. Alice had only recently noticed this cabinet. Normally, she played in her nursery, but when the room was being aired out, Miss Thompson either took Alice for a walk or to the living room. And the living room was full of interesting things that Alice planned to explore soon. The doctor brought Monica's discharge papers and placed them on the bedside table. You can get ready to go home. Is someone coming to pick you up? Yes, my husband was coming. When you're dressed, let the nurse know, and she'll help you with the baby. Okay. Monica had already applied makeup, fixed her hair, and was ready to dress and go home. She called her parents. Mom, I'm coming home today. You can come in a week to see Victor. Okay, dear. How are you? How's our grandson? Both are healthy, thank God. Monica spat over her left shoulder. Then we're very happy. We'll definitely come. Dad can't wait to see his grandson. Is Marcus coming for you? Yes, Mom. I've also arranged with the photographer. We'll have beautiful photos. We really want to see them, can't wait. Just wait a week, and you'll see everything yourself and hold your grandson. No sooner had she hung up than Marcus called. I'm waiting downstairs. The photographer will be waiting for you in the lobby in the first room. I arranged it with the head of the maternity ward. Great. Then we're getting dressed. Monica pressed the button, and a few minutes later, a nurse entered the room. We're getting ready to leave. Can you help, please? Yes, of course. Let me dress the baby. Monica finished dressing, feeling a bit warm. The nurse dressed Victor and placed him in a beautiful lace blanket. Do you want to tie it with a ribbon? No need. We already know it's a boy. Then let's go. You carry the baby, and I'll take the bags. They left the room and headed to the elevator. Downstairs, Marcus and the photographer were waiting for them. Come this way. We're going to have a little photo session now. Monica entered the room and followed the photographer's instructions. All right, hold the baby in your arms and tilt your head slightly. Yes, yes, just like that. Now a couple more shots from the side when you're standing and holding him close. He took several pictures of Monica with the baby and invited Marcus to participate in the photo session. Okay, stand beside her. Hold the baby closer, yes. Like that. The photos will be ready tomorrow evening. I'll process and print them. I'll send the originals to Marcus by email. Great. Monica, let me put the bags in the trunk. Sit here for a couple of minutes. They left the maternity ward and approached the car. Monica turned back to look at the maternity ward. Women were looking out of the window at them. Each of them wished to be taken away like that, but not everyone gets such a chance. Marcus placed Victor in a special car seat with an insert for newborns. Monica sat next to him. Marcus sat and looked back at his wife and son once more. 
suddenly, he felt a sharp pain in his chest, and his vision darkened. He only regained consciousness in the hospital with an four drip next to him. No one was around him. Monica was busy with the children. Marcus's parents lived in another city 1,000 kilometers away and couldn't come. A doctor entered the room. Good day, Marcus. How are you feeling? Better now. What happened to me? Severe exhaustion. Your blood pressure and blood sugar dropped sharply. Yes, I've been working a lot. And forgetting to eat and sleep properly. Yes, probably. Is everything that bad? Everything has stabilized now, but I urge you not to push yourself to this condition again and not to overload the already overloaded hospital staff. Thank you, doctor. I'll try. I'll leave you here for today, and we'll check again tomorrow. Most likely, you'll be discharged. The doctor turned and left the room. Yes, thank you. Marcus wearily closed his eyes. He wanted to sleep. The door opened again, and Monica entered the room in shoe covers and a robe. You scared me so much. Thank goodness it didn't happen while you were driving. Monica looked worried. Everything's fine, the doctor said. Relax. How's Victor? Marcus looked at Monica in surprise. He's at home. My parents arrived. Mom stayed with him. Don't worry, everything's fine. I expressed milk, so he should be okay. Please take care of yourself. I promise I won't do that again. Well, try not to. I brought you fruits and chocolate. You need to replenish your energy. I'll do that right now. Marcus sat on the bed and took out a banana from the bag. He peeled it and started eating. Monica sat down next to him on the bed and started talking. You know, I can't reach Christine. I call her, but her phone is unavailable. Something must have happened. I hope her stepfather didn't harm her. From your stories, it sounds like she's the one who would harm him first. She's quite a fighter. Maybe so, but I need to go see her. My gut feeling tells me the silence isn't good. Go then. How much longer can your parents stay with us? They said a week, no more. They're used to their beds, to their home. I completely understand them. I can't stay long in someone else's house either. Then I'll go see Christine tomorrow and find out everything. Of course, she's your friend. Monica, thanks for the fruits. Can I sleep now? Yes, I'll leave you. The doctor said you have low hemoglobin. When you get home, eat beef liver and drink pomegranate juice. And no work for at least a week. I'll listen and obey. Monica left the room, went down to the lobby. I need to call mom and let her know I'll be delayed. She was going to Christine's. Mom, I was at Marcus's hospital. He's fine, and I'll be a little late. I want to visit Christine. Okay, dear. We fed Victor. He's asleep. Do what you planned. Thanks, Mom. You're the best. Monica left the hospital, removed her shoe covers, and headed to the parking lot. She had to sit behind the wheel of Marcus's car when he lost consciousness. Then she could barely move him to the neighboring seat. She had to ask a man from the neighboring car for help. Monica worried about how she would manage such a large car, but in reality, it wasn't that difficult. And this time, she sat in the driver's seat and felt the full power of the car. When the car reached a speed of 60 km per hour just 10 seconds after starting, Monica looked down on the drivers of small cars. From the car, it seemed to her that they were unserious, not real. Christine's mother lived two houses away from her parents' house. Monica looked around. There wasn't much space in the yard to park such a large car. But she found a place near the fence. She got out of the car and set the alarm. Looking up, Monica glanced at Christine's apartment windows. They were dark. A bad feeling stirred in her heart. She dialed the intercom code. The door opened. Strange that they haven't changed it in so many years, thought Monica and quickly opened the door. 
The hallway smelled unpleasantly of the basement and mold. Christina lived on the third floor. It was possible to climb the stairs, but Monica disliked walking up such a staircase. She took the elevator and emerged onto the landing where the doors of four apartments were located. She remembered the door leading to Christina's apartment and rang the bell. No one approached for a long time, and just as she was about to leave, the door suddenly opened. Monica, is that you? I wouldn't recognize you. Yes, Aunt Gwen. Where's Christina? Come in. The woman swung open the door and waited for Monica to enter. What happened? Where's Christina? Where are the children? Oh, Monica. Don't ask. It was terrible. Christina killed my husband. How did she kill him? I don't know, I wasn't home. When I came back, he was already lying dead on the floor. She stabbed him, and my grandchildren were taken to an orphanage. They didn't leave them with me, said Christina's mother, tears streaming down her face. That explains why my heart sank. Where's Christina now? She's in pre-trial detention, waiting for trial. That's where she belongs. Can I visit her? Yes, I suppose so. When did all this happen, Aunt Gwen? A week ago, Monica. Do you think they'll convict her? Send her to prison? Why did they take my grandchildren? Christina's mother burst into tears. Aunt Gwen, please don't cry. Everything will be okay. They'll release Christina. I think she did it in a state of shock. She told me that her stepfather was harassing her. She's lying about everything. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He couldn't have done that, Christina's mother said, though it was clear she wasn't entirely convinced herself. Which pretrial detention center is Christina in? How should I know? I don't know where they took her. They said she'll be in pretrial detention. Did you at least give her some belongings? No. I was in shock from what she did. Okay, we need to gather the essentials now, clothes, soap, a toothbrush, a towel, wet wipes, toilet paper, a warm sweater, a comb. Do you have these? Yes, I'll get them now. Monica, are you going to visit her? I'll put a book for Christina in the bag. Please do. Can we give her food? I don't know, maybe some cookies and juice. Take them. Maybe you can pass them along. Christina's mother packed a large bag and handed it to Monica. Monica said, goodbye, to Gwen and headed home. She decided to visit Christina tomorrow. The next day, Marcus was discharged from the hospital because all his indicators had improved, and he asked the doctor not to keep him in the hospital for long. Marcus called Monica as soon as he heard about his discharge. I'm being discharged, as strange as it sounds. You don't need to pick me up, I'll take a taxi. Marcus, you're going by yourself? I'll manage. I'm feeling much better now. Wait for me. I'll be there soon. I really want to take a shower and wash off this hospital dust. Okay, we'll wait for you. Monica thought about how to help Christina, but nothing came to mind yet. She took the bags of belongings and went to the pretrial detention center where Christina was being held. After much argument, she was allowed to visit her. Christina looked unwell. The sparkle was gone from her eyes, and her hair was tangled as if she hadn't brushed it at all. Hey, are you okay? Monica tried to understand what was on her friend's mind. No, I'm not okay, at all. I'm sitting in a cell with homeless people and alcoholics. But you know what, I don't regret what I did at all. If I had to go through it again, I would. Tell me how it all happened, if you can. That day, mom went to the store, and I went to take care of the kids. That scumbag was also home. As soon as mom left, he started harassing me. Grabbing my chest, my butt. I pushed back and ran away as best I could. You know I'm patient. But then he pushed Genevieve so hard she hit the wall and started bleeding. The tigress in me woke up. The rest is a blur. The knife was in my hand, it all happened very quickly. 
I came to my senses when he was already lying on the floor in a pool of blood. I almost lost my mind then, I rushed to check his pulse, but it was too late. He was dead. That bastard deserved it. But you'll tell everything in court, how it happened. Do you have a lawyer? Yes, they sent me a young girl just out of college. She's full of enthusiasm, unlike me. I have a bad feeling that I'll end up in prison for a long time. Everything will be fine. I'll ask Marcus, maybe he knows a lawyer who could help. Monica squeezed Christina's hand. Thank you, Monica, but even a paid lawyer probably won't be able to help me. At least they might reduce the sentence. That's what I'm starting to believe more. How are my children? Where are they? With mom? Christina, they're in an orphanage. They were taken from your mother. That's for the best. An orphanage isn't the worst place for them. Monica, take care of my children, please. If you can, take them in, I beg you. I'll sign all the necessary papers. Christina's gaze went from lifeless to pleading. She grabbed both of Monica's hands tightly. Of course, Christina. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it today. First, I'll go to where they were taken and bring them everything they need. By the way, what did you name your son? You told me you wanted to name him Philip or Forrest. Eric. I named him Eric. Genevieve and Eric. Don't worry, and hang in there. Remember, I'm here. Wrap it up. The door opened, and the female guard warned the friends. Come on, time's up. Take care. Monica stood up, hugged Christina, and went to the door, discreetly wiping away tears. She arrived home, washed her hands, and went to the children. At that moment, a taxi pulled up to the house. Marcus got out and headed towards the house. Monica was ready. Lunch was prepared, her mother helped to cook. The table was set. They were just waiting for Marcus. The door swung open, and Marcus loudly announced his arrival. I'm home. Is anyone going to greet me? Where's my family? Monica came out with Victor in her arms. Mrs. Thompson followed with Alice. Monica's parents came after them. Wow, turns out I have a big family. Marcus, your family is waiting for you at the table. Come in and sit. I want to feed you well. You look very thin. Marcus came into the kitchen and was surprised by the amount of food on the table. He usually ate just sandwiches while working. In the evening, he cooked meat, sliced it into slices, and made a sandwich. But in recent days, he had been so absorbed in work that he even stopped eating sandwiches. That's how Marcus pushed himself to the brink of fainting at the most crucial moment. Plus, he was very worried about getting everything done on time. So much so that he had a nervous breakdown, which he didn't like at all. He just fell like a lady at the ball. He spent all his strength. Don't forget to eat on time. Now that Monica's home, I think everything will be fine. They sat at the table for a long time talking. Alice pulled Marcus's watch off his wrist and disappeared with them under the table. For several minutes, there was concentrated panting. Suddenly, a loud thud was heard. Who and when gave Alice the hammer remained a mystery, but now the broken watch lay on the floor. Look at my clever daughter. She knew Dad needed new watches, so she decided to dispose of the old ones so Dad wouldn't worry, Marcus laughed, patting Alice on the head, while she frowned, looking at everyone in turn and clutching the hammer tightly. Mrs. Thompson cautiously took the threatening tool from the girl and stashed it away in the pantry. Alice sat on the floor, meticulously sorting through the screws and gears of what used to proudly be called a watch. Marcus, I wanted to talk to you about Christina's children. What about them? She killed her stepfather in a state of shock, and she's facing trial and a long prison sentence. Her children, Genevieve and Eric, were taken to an orphanage. I promised Christina that I would take care of her children and her. And what do you want from me? I want you to contact your acquaintance, a lawyer, to prepare all the documents so that we can take the children under guardianship. And also, to help Christina get a shorter sentence if possible. 
Okay, I'll call Eugene Murphy right now. He's a good lawyer. One of my clients recommended him to me once, I just need to find his business card. Marcus walked into his study and started rummaging through the desk drawers. He opened all the notepads, albums, notebooks. He had tucked the lawyer's business card somewhere in here. Suddenly, it fell out of a leather notebook that Monica had given him once. Marcus took the business card and dialed the number. Eugene, hello. Mr. Dalton recommended you to me. Do you know him? Yes. How can I help? Eugene, could we meet in town at a cafe? Or perhaps you could come to our house, and we can talk here in detail. I prefer not to discuss this over the phone. I'm free right now. I can come to you. Send me the location. Sure, I'll send you the coordinates. Perfect. I'll put the address in my GPS and head over. Lawyer Eugene Murphy pulled up to Marcus's house. Eugene looked at the house and decided that his client was fairly well off and that he could make some good money. He walked up to the house, pressed the doorbell, and waited for the ornate iron door adorned with metal flowers to open on its own. The gates also had large flowers forged from yellowish metal. It looked very beautiful. The lawyer walked along the stone path, entered the house, where Marcus was waiting for him. Monica and the children were in the children's room. Mrs. Thompson was getting Alice ready for a walk, and Monica was dressing Victor. They were about to leave for a walk any minute. Monica's parents had already left home as soon as they made sure Marcus was okay. Marcus invited Eugene to sit on the leather sofa and offered him coffee. Would you like some coffee? I won't say no. It's been a crazy day. Please make yourself comfortable, and while you're at it, I'll give you a warm-up task. We need to take guardianship of someone else's children who ended up in an orphanage. How many children and for what reason are they in the orphanage? Their mother is behind bars. She's a friend of my wife. I see. Let me think about it. Think about it. In the meantime, I'll prepare some coffee for you. With these words, Marcus went to the kitchen, where he always made coffee in the mornings. After preparing and pouring two cups of aromatic beverage, he brought them over and placed them on the marble table. I've dealt with a similar case. I can try to handle it. I can't promise quick results. Okay. The second request is to reduce the punishment for the mother of the children. That might be more difficult, but I'll do my best. Where is she being held? She's in the investigative isolation unit of our district. I'll arrange a meeting with her and find out the details of the case. Where are the children located? They're in the orphanage. Write down the names and surnames of the children for me. Monica. Marcus called his wife loudly. What's up? Please write down the names and surnames of Christina's children, hurry. Monica went downstairs, handed the sheet with the names to the lawyer, and bid them farewell. I will inform you of the details as soon as I have sufficient information about the children. All right, Eugene. I hope our collaboration will be fruitful and successful. I have no doubt about that. I'm considered a master at solving complex problems. And yours are not easy. Please do your best. Have we discussed the fee? I think the fee will be satisfactory for both of us. I'll send you the figure and you can let me know if you can afford it or not. I think I can. Goodbye. Goodbye. Eugene exited through the gate and got into his car. There, he paused for a moment, contemplating the best approach. Suddenly, a brilliant idea came to him and he started the car. The engine roared to life and smoothly pulled away. Eugene thought the solution was elegant and relatively easy to execute. He just wanted to clarify the details of the case. Eugene headed straight to the investigative isolation unit where Christina was being held. After obtaining permission from the guard for a meeting, he entered the visitation room. The female guard escorted Christina. You have half an hour. I think we'll finish earlier, Eugene said. The time has started. Eugene placed a folder on the table and took out a pen and paper. Christina, my name is Eugene. 
I'm a lawyer here at the request of Marcus. He hired me to assist you and your children. I'll need you to provide a completely honest account of the facts. I'm ready. Take the pen and paper. Write down all the information from your perspective, without emotional coloring. Just the facts. Okay. Christina wrote quickly, and soon the entire sheet was filled on one side. She flipped it over. Do you know which orphanage your children are in? No. I'll find out. Write down the precise names and surnames of each child for me. On this sheet? Christina looked questioningly at Eugene. Yes, below. Have you written them down? Yes, I've written down as much detail as possible. For now, that's enough. If additional information is needed, I'll come back to you. Thank you. Do you have any other requests? I want to go home to my children. That's what I'll be working on in the near future. Wait for updates and don't lose hope, most importantly. Eugene waved and left the visitation room. The female guard escorted Christina back to her cell. In the cell, there were four women. Two of them were homeless. It smelled terribly of garbage and unwashed bodies. Another woman was a young Roma. She was caught at the station asking people for money. The Roma woman's name was Teresa. What's your name, beautiful? The Roma woman addressed Christina. Christina. Why? Let me read your fortune while we're stuck here. It's free, I inherited the gift from my grandmother. I see a lot and tell people the truth. Some believe, some don't. Read it. What do you need? Your hand. The Roma woman took Christina's hand and frowned. What's wrong? I won't say, or you'll be upset. Tell me. Since you insist, here's my word. Your children will end up in another family. The woman who takes them will drink a lot, and they will be in trouble. There won't be a man around this woman. He's been gone from her for a long time. Wait, I see that when things get really bad for the children, this man will come to her. Are you talking about Monica? This woman is your longtime friend. Definitely Monica. But she's not an alcoholic, is she? Strange. Will I be in prison for a long time? Your sentence will be short but difficult. It won't be easy for you. Thanks for that. Teresa turned away from Christina and began to comb her long dark hair, humming a melodious tune. Christina felt disappointed upon realizing that she would still have to serve her sentence. And perhaps the entire term. I'm sorry, beautiful. It's not good that I upset you a little. Give me your hand again. I think I saw a man there. Christina extended her left hand to the fortune teller. Yes, yes. Here he is. He entered your life unexpectedly. He's an influential person. His life isn't easy, but he will stay with you. Wow. Who is he? You'll find out in due time, but this person is your destiny. Your fates are intertwined. Thank you, Teresa. That's more interesting already. Don't be sad, beautiful. There will be more good than bad in your life. Your children will be with you. I miss them so much, it breaks my heart. Enough talking there, everyone go to sleep. The window in the cell door opened, and the female guard inspected the room. The women lay down on their beds and fell silent. The two homeless women whispered about something. The cell door opened, and the female guard entered, striking both women with her baton a couple of times. I said sleep. Sorry, we won't do it again. You're nothing but trouble. Everyone sleep. Lawyer Eugene Murphy was rightfully considered a master of his trade. Not long after, the children were already with Monica and Marcus. Christina received a short sentence in court. Having received a decent fee, Eugene placed another satisfying checkmark on his list of accomplishments. Marcus, let's have Genevieve and Victor settle in the room next to the kids' room. I can't imagine a better way to organize it to make them comfortable. The children are scared. 
Maybe let them sleep together with our kids for now? Monica was concerned. No, Monica. They should have their own room. Eric will cry and wake Victor up. Marcus didn't like the idea of settling all the children together. I feel awkward asking Mrs. Thompson to watch over these children. Maybe she'll agree for an additional fee? Of course, I'll talk to her myself. Let her look after the older children, and you can take care of the younger ones. Marcus suggested, but he wasn't sure if Monica would agree. Why didn't I think of this myself? I could breastfeed both children. I have plenty of milk. Monica straightened proudly and smiled, imagining herself feeding the children one by one and together. It will be wonderful. I think Christina will be grateful to you. Marcus looked approvingly at Monica and went to the workshop. And so it happened. The children were settled in rooms next to each other, and another children's room was arranged for Christina's children. Monica took photos and sent joint children's photos once a month, so Christina could see how her children were growing. Kiss them for me, she wrote in letters, I miss them so much. Mrs. Thompson agreed to look after the girls and helped Monica with the boys. They all went for walks together as one big family. Alice and Genevieve unexpectedly became friends and hardly ever argued, except sometimes over candy. Monica didn't allow sweets before lunch, giving each of them a couple of candies or a square of dark chocolate. Genevieve managed to grab a candy from Alice, and she started to protest loudly. But most days went by similarly. Marcus worked, orders came to him regularly, and payments for them too. So, as soon as the girls grew older, a Montessori educator was invited for them. She worked with the girls, gave them various practical tasks, introduced them to different subjects and materials, taught them to grind crackers, and wash doll clothes. The girls loved the lessons and eagerly awaited each visit from their Miss Roberts. Monica took the children to the pool, where they were coached to swim. Another coach worked with the boys, and the lessons were a bit different there. The children loved the water and eagerly went to the pool, feeling very upset when they couldn't visit due to illness. Three years passed. The little ones grew up. The girls were five years old, the boys were three. They were active and lively children. Mrs. Thompson was proud of her charges. The children were polite and obedient. Christina had a good standing with the colony administration, and they were advancing her for conditional early release. They invited Eugene again, and he made every effort on his part to make this action happen. Eugene, help us, and count on our assistance, Monica pleaded with him. I'll do my best within my capacity. Eugene assumed an important demeanor to justify his fee. The children need their mother. Although they are doing well and we already have an attachment to them. Christina was released from the colony on the same day as her cellmate, Sophia. Jean's brother greeted her. Monica and Marcus hadn't arrived yet, so Christina conversed with Sophia and her brother. Christina, come visit us, we invite you. There's a lot we need to talk about. Haven't we talked enough in the cell? Jean burst out laughing. Jean, remind me, where do you live? We're in the village on the outskirts of town. Ah, uh. I know. My teacher used to live there. I went there for lessons. So come on over. Marcus's car pulled up. Monica got out and ran to meet Christina. Monica hugged Christina and started crying. Monica, enough. Please. Christina was crying heavily. Girls, stop crying, or I'll start crying too, Jean said. Jean cried along with them. Thomas hugged her and kissed her on the forehead. Christina said, goodbye, to Sophia and Thomas, took her things, and sat in the back seat of the car. The car moved off, and Christina was pleased to see the prison walls disappear from view. Christina, why don't you take a shower first, change your clothes, and then go to the kids so they don't get scared. Okay? Okay, Monica. I can't wait to wash this dirt off myself. They arrived home, and the gates swung open to allow the car to enter. The car slowly drove onto the property, stopped near the entrance. Marcus got out to open the doors for Monica and Christina. 
The women entered the house, and he drove his car under the canopy. Christina went to take a shower. She washed herself for a long time and thoroughly. She felt like the prison dirt had deeply ingrained itself into her skin. But finally, she decided she was clean and stepped out of the shower. Monica placed a home dress on a chair for her. Christina put it on and looked at herself in the mirror. Only a shadow of the old Christina remained there. Only her gray eyes stubbornly stared back at her from the reflection. Christina, the children are asleep. Come on, let's go see them. Monica entered the room, took Christina by the hand, and led her to the children's rooms. They entered Genevieve and Eric's room very cautiously to avoid making noise. Christina approached them on tiptoe and gazed with affection at the innocent faces of the sleeping children. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Monica came up from behind, embraced her friend by the shoulders. Christina turned around and left the children's room. They've grown so much. And I haven't seen them. But now you're with them and you'll never be apart again. I won't let anyone hurt them. Now I'm here, children. Christina wiped her tears and turned to Monica. Shall we go eat something? Yes, of course. Are you hungry? We need to feed you. Today for lunch, it's duck with apples. If this continues, in a week I won't fit through the door of the children's room. You'll fit. You've always eaten so little, as far as I can remember. It's nothing, now you'll see how I eat. I think I'll not only swallow your duck hole but also an elephant if you have one. Well, we don't have an elephant, but I'll think about it. Good idea. Monica laughed, and the friends went to the kitchen. While Monica set the table, Christina approached the window and looked out at the beautiful garden below the house. Monica, you're so lucky. What a beautiful home you have. I missed nature so much in prison. It's just concrete walls and iron there. Even the walks are in a concrete sack. You're free now and you'll see this every day until you get tired of it. I'm telling you, stay until Genevieve and Eric grow a bit. Then you can find a job for yourself. Weren't we talking about you being a nanny? Yes, but I'd feel awkward telling Mrs. Thompson now that you'll be taking over her duties. Just live comfortably. It does feel awkward. She helped you with my children. You went for walks together. I don't even know how to thank both of you. Christina fell silent in confusion. No need for thanks. Just be with us. Monica finished the conversation by placing a large oval dish of roasted duck on the table. It emitted a tantalizing aroma. Christina's mouth watered. Marcus should be coming soon, but you don't have to wait for him, eat. With these words, Monica placed a large piece of duck on Christina's plate. You've started eating duck without me? Marcus approached the table, feigning indignation. Sorry, Marcus. We have a hungry person here. Christina promised to eat the duck. No, but I don't play like that. What about me? Where's my duck? Calm down, here's your piece. Monica placed a duck leg on Marcus's plate. On the table were vegetables and greens, as well as a plate of cheese and a separate plate of bread. Everyone ate the duck in silence. Soon, only the bones of the proud bird known as the duck remained. Christina lived in Marcus and Monica's house. She looked after her children and helped Monica with hers. They also divided the housework between them. Various clients came to Marcus. He usually met them in the hall, where women rarely went. They mainly spent time in the kitchen and went for walks in the yard. Marcus built large swings and a gazebo for resting on sunny days. Sandboxes were also constructed for the children, and an inflatable pool was set up where the kids splashed around happily on hot days. On one of those hot days, an unusual visitor came to Marcus. He entered through the gate and unexpectedly bumped into Christina, who was retrieving a child's ball that had fallen into the flower bed. Excuse me, please. I didn't mean to. Christina wiped the sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand and looked at the stranger. He was a tall, fair-haired, blue-eyed man with radiant wrinkles at the corners of his eyes. 
he had a very pleasant smile. Please excuse me. I was clumsily walking past you. Where can I find Marcus? He's inside. Go through that door. I feel awkward asking you, but could you and Marcus make us a cup of coffee and bring a glass of water each? Yes, of course. My name is Raphael. And what's your name, beautiful gray-eyed fairy? The fairy's name is Christina. For some reason, Christina felt embarrassed and gave her full name. Excellent, Christina. So, I'm off to Marcus, and the fairy will bring us coffee if she wishes. Raphael smiled with a charming smile and walked into the house. Christina stopped as if she had been struck by tetanus. She couldn't understand why her cheeks suddenly flared up, and a shiver ran through her body. Did she really react that way to Raphael's smile? She remembered the fortune teller's prediction that she would have a man destined by fate. And she decided to test this. She handed the ball to Monica, told her she was asked to make coffee, and went to the kitchen. In the kitchen, she and Monica cooked in turns, each having their own set of favorite dishes. For example, Monica loved cooking meat and poultry. She made delicious schnitzel and excellent roasted poultry. And Christina loved baking and vegetable salads. She never tired of combining different greens and vegetables. It always turned out very tasty. But this time, she was only required to make coffee. Pour a glass of water and bring it. Christina prepared everything. But the thought of having to bring it all to the hall and place it in front of the men made her feel cold inside. Suddenly, Raphael entered the kitchen and saw the tray with cups and glasses. Let me help you, I'll take everything. He took the tray from Christina's hands, lightly brushing against her hand. Christina caught her breath, her heart pounding wildly and ready to leap out of her chest. What's happening to me? Christina tried to leave the house as inconspicuously as possible. She closed the door to the kitchen and walked past the men towards the exit. Christina, wait. Don't leave, I'm done. Raphael stood up and followed her. The woman quickened her pace, but Raphael didn't fall behind. At the exit, he grabbed Christina's hand. You're a goddess. I haven't seen such beauty in a long time. You must be mistaking me for someone else. Christina said this out of confusion. She was very pleased to hear such words from him. Although she had heard similar things before, she never trusted men who said them. I can't be mistaken. When I saw you, my heart raced as if I'd run a marathon. Maybe you have tachycardia? Christina smiled. Don't believe me? I can see that you've had a tough life. How do you know that? I can see it in your eyes. A person's eyes tell a lot. I really like your eyes. I'd like to dive deeper and never come up. Raphael, you have a way with words. How many hearts have you broken, confess? Just one. My wife's. But she passed away five years ago. I'm sorry, I didn't know. It's okay, I wasn't myself back then. Life wasn't kind to me. I even wanted to end it, that's how much I loved her. A shadow passed over Raphael's face. And what saved you then? Strangely enough, music did. One day, a musician friend of mine came from abroad and invited me to a concert. After that concert, I came out a completely different person and decided to spend the rest of my life not sulking and not fighting the world. And did you succeed? Christina looked with interest at her interlocutor. It felt like they had known each other for a long time. Yes, I have a large business. I'm the head of a big company. I came to Marcus to order a fence for my wife's grave. Why him specifically? There are plenty of companies around that do that. I saw his work and it seemed like he would understand exactly what I wanted and do it very well. Then you really didn't make a mistake. Marcus is a master of his craft. Christina, how would you feel about me inviting you to a cafe tomorrow evening? With pleasure. Raphael and Christina started dating. Their romance unfolded right before the astonished eyes of Monica and Marcus. 
Christina looked radiant with happiness, and her beauty sparkled in a special way. He visited their home and the two of them sat in the gazebo. When he first saw the children, he loved Christina even more. Genevieve and Eric are exact copies of you, my goddess. Now I will be doubly happy. My wife and I didn't have children. And then came the moment when Raphael proposed to Christina. It was at sunset on a summer day. Christina was sitting on the swings with the children. Raphael took Christina's hand, and she got off the swing. Raphael, I don't understand, you're so serious. Did something happen? You happened in my life, and it's the best thing that's happened to me lately. I want you to be my wife. Christina, congratulations. Monica squealed and rushed to hug her friend. So, you're stealing a woman right from my yard, Marcus joked and patted Raphael on the shoulder. The wedding took place a month later. All the celebrations were held in Raphael's backyard, where he invited Marcus along with his family. Genevieve and Alice carried the train of Christina's wedding dress. There were few guests, only the closest ones. And of course, Marcus and Monica were there. The house was half empty. The second children's room stood empty. Monica, of course, wished her friend happiness, but at the same time, she felt melancholic without her. She would enter the room and leave, but Christina was not there. Meanwhile, Christina flew with Raphael and the children to Bali. She sent many photos from there, where they were happy and content, swimming in the sea, eating fruits, or sitting by the pool. Christina had to find her ex-husband to get permission for the children to leave. Her husband didn't want to give permission, but after talking with Raphael, he suddenly changed his mind and signed all the necessary papers. Marcus flew on a business trip to Venezuela. He was invited by a sculptor friend. The government placed a large order for a beautiful cast iron fence and wrought iron sculptures. They saw Marcus's work and signed a contract with him for six months. He decided not to take his family with him for fear that they might catch something here, like tropical diseases. Monica was left alone in the house and started drinking frequently. Mrs. Thompson was always with the children. Monica was left to fend for herself. The money Marcus left her with somehow ran out very quickly. But there was still money left for drinking. After all, she didn't drink ordinary wines, she bought expensive varieties. Monica, how are you doing? Marcus called from the hotel room. It's very hot here. I work at night. Marcus, why are you stumbling over your words? My head hurts a lot, I took a pill. And are the children okay? Don't worry, they're fine. I was already asleep when you woke me up. Okay, then rest. I'll finish work in a week and come. Goodbye. Monica took another bottle of wine from the cupboard and poured herself a glass. When Marcus returned, he saw Monica drunk and the children hungry. Mrs. Thompson told him that social services had come because compassionate neighbors had reported hearing the children crying for their mom because they were hungry. This is the last thing I needed. Marcus got angry. How could you, the mother of my children, stoop so low that you didn't even feed the children? I can't forgive you for this, Monica. Marcus, you have to understand me. Christina left. She's happy. You're on the other side of the planet. I'm all alone. I still can't understand that. I don't want to see you. Marcus left the house and went to the gallery where his sculptures were exhibited. He wandered through the halls and suddenly his gaze stopped at the horses. He depicted mustangs running through the prairie. Their manies were flowing. The sculpture captured the freedom and energy of wild animals. Marcus suddenly remembered Larissa, who had once pushed him. He smiled and dialed her number. Marcus, I'm so glad to hear from you. Where have you been? Larissa's velvety voice made Marcus shiver. I've been busy. Larissa, could we meet? I'm busy today. Let's do it tomorrow. Okay. Let's meet tomorrow at 6 p.m. Your call is very unexpected, but I'm very glad about it. I'm glad to hear from you too. They met near the entrance of the gallery and walked along the avenue. 
There were many people around, but they didn't notice them. Marcus thought that all his feelings for Larissa were just passion and indulgence, and he tried to drown them out with work and family life. But when he saw Larissa again, the fire inside him ignited with renewed intensity. His vision darkened, and he made an effort to think clearly. He couldn't remember how they ended up in the hotel room, and the night passed like a minute. In the morning, the lovers woke up happy but unsatisfied. After their morning caresses, they mustered the strength to order breakfast in the room. Marcus, I didn't expect this to happen. You're such a prominent man. It was bound to happen, Larissa, sooner or later. Marcus kissed Larissa on the neck, and they again merged in passionate embrace. Monica tore at her hair, but it was too late. Marcus could not forgive the betrayal towards their children and filed for divorce. They were quickly divorced with the help of the same lawyer, Eugene Murphy. Monica didn't receive anything from her husband's property. He didn't give her the children either. Mrs. Thompson stayed to work at Marcus's house. Christina arrived when she learned of what had happened. Monica, maybe he'll change his mind? You didn't cheat on him. You know Marcus. For him, the children are the most important thing. Because of my drinking, anything could have happened to them. It's all my fault. Social services have already come. If it weren't for Marcus, they would have taken the children away from me. It's very sad that it happened this way. Maybe I should talk to him? It's pointless. If Marcus has made a decision, he never changes it. And where will you go now? And the children, did they stay with him? Yes, and that's the worst part. I can see them on weekends. You don't know everything yet. He has a woman. Are you serious? Who is she? Some kind of singer, I think. So he left you because of her? No. He met her after we broke up after a fight. Monica moved in with her parents. She visited the children as often as she could. Marcus arranged his personal life. He brought Larissa into his home, but besides passion and a love for music, they had no common interests. Marcus immersed himself completely in his work again. Meanwhile, Larissa began recording albums in a recording studio downtown. She didn't interact very eagerly with Marcus's children. She preferred parties and social gatherings. Larissa, I'd like you to spend more time with the children. Find common ground with them. Marcus, I'm trying, but they're very attached to their mom. And they call me a aunt. Did you expect them to call you the mom right away? That doesn't happen. You have to earn that title. I want to tell you that my children are the most precious thing I have. And I would like my woman to love them too. I love your children, but I have very little experience with kids. I've never had my own. My friends have kids, but I haven't spent much time with them. Marcus, I'll do everything possible for them to love me. I hope you heard me. Larissa tried her best, but she didn't feel any love for someone else's children inside. Towards Marcus, yes, she was burning with passion, but this passion was overshadowed by the presence of two children. At that moment, Monica lay on the couch crying bitterly, recalling her beautiful life with Marcus and the children. What a fool I am. Why did I allow myself to sink to such shame? Will Marcus never forgive me? Monica called Marcus to say that she was going to come visit the children. Come over. I have a big order, I'll be in the workshop. Larissa went to the recording studio. Monica didn't waste a minute. She called a taxi and quickly arrived at Marcus's house. The children ran out to meet her. Marcus watched the meeting from the workshop. His heart tightened when he saw the children and Monica crying, embracing each other. Returning to the workshop, he finished the fence element and struck the anvil with all his might. Marcus, you fool. A stubborn fool. You lost your wife. And now, because of your stupidity, you'll lose your children. After thinking it over, he made a decision. Monica, after visiting the children, went home. She didn't go to say, goodbye, to Marcus. She was in pain and ashamed. 
She loved Marcus, but what was even worse for her was realizing the extent of her shame. She allowed the children to go hungry and social services to come to her home. This was an unforgivable mistake. Marcus would never forgive her for this for the rest of his life. She went to her parents and called Christina. Listen, I need to leave. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, Raphael and I are planning to go to Bali now. We'll spend the winter there. Come with us. I'd love to. I'll help you look after your kids. After hanging up, Monica started getting ready. She took only the essentials. All her things fit into one suitcase. The plane was leaving in two days. Monica talked to her parents, and they let her go. She didn't say anything to Marcus. She was calm, but after just 20 minutes of calm, the phone rang. Marcus had finished work and was already delivering the final elements of the fence to the customer when Mrs. Thompson rushed into the workshop. Quickly, Victor's struggling to breathe. Marcus threw his tools to the ground and quickly found himself at home. The boy couldn't exhale. Bring a basin of hot water. That's it, breathe calmly, calmly. I'll press certain points on your hands, listen to me, and breathe. Mrs. Thompson brought a basin of hot water, and together they removed Victor's socks and dipped his feet into the basin. The boy calmed down and started breathing evenly. Marcus called an ambulance and went to the stairs to answer the phone. I need to call Monica. I think she should know. She's the mother. Go ahead. Mrs. Thompson took the phone out of her pocket and dialed Monica's number. Monica was just checking her luggage and didn't answer the call immediately. Mrs. Thompson, what happened? Something with the kids? Yes, Monica. Victor started struggling to breathe. What are you saying? Did you call an ambulance? Yes, they're coming. I'm coming over too. Monica called a taxi and quickly went home. On the way, she called Christina. Christina, I won't be able to fly. Victor is seriously ill. What happened? He had an attack. He started struggling to breathe. You understand, I won't be able to go anywhere. Yes, of course. No problem. We'll cancel the tickets, don't worry. Let me know later how Victor is doing. Okay. The taxi arrived at the house, and Monica literally flew out of it. She opened the gate and ran into the house. She ran upstairs to the children's room. Alice was hugging Victor and singing him a lullaby that Monica had once sung to her. Mommy. Later, the ambulance arrived and gave him an injection. He stopped struggling to breathe. Mama. You're not going anywhere else, right? My sweet ones. No, I won't leave you anywhere else. I'll be with you until you chase me away. But how can we chase you away? You're our mom. And will Aunt Larissa also live with us? It depends on what Dad decides. We don't want her to live here. She's very noisy and always asks us to stay in the children's room. But we want to go out. Let's go for a walk. The weather outside is nice. Let's go, Mom. Monica helped the children get dressed. They left the house and all walked together to the swings, sitting next to each other. Monica was in the middle, with the children on either side. They started swinging gently on the swings, and Monica began to sing a cheerful song to them. We're going, going, going to distant lands. Happy neighbors. Joyful friends. Marcus watched them from the window, torn inside. One part of him said that this was his family, his wife, while the other could not forgive his wife's mistake. He moved away from the window and sat in a chair. Deep inside, Marcus understood that with Larissa, it was only passion that bound them. There was not that deep attachment and tenderness that he had once felt for Monica. Marcus picked up the phone and dialed Larissa's number. Yes, Marcus. I'm finishing up. I'll be there soon. Larissa, don't come. It's over. I'll send your things tomorrow. I've returned to my wife, forgive me. I felt it. 
Thank you for everything. You were a wonderful lover. And you too. Forgive me once again. And you too. Ending the call, Marcus went downstairs and approached Monica and the children. It's getting chilly. Let's all go home. Marcus. Don't say anything, please. Let's all go inside. And you too, Monica. What about Larissa? It's over with Larissa. You all are my family. Marcus, does this mean you've forgiven me? It means our family is moving to a new level of responsibility and relationship with each other. We must be more attentive to each other and to the children, naturally. Marcus, I've realized everything. If you only knew how deeply I regretted what I did. You've already faced your punishment. Let's all go inside for some tea. Mrs. Thompson has prepared a lemon pie. They all entered the house, and the glass door with wrought golden flowers closed behind them.